Welcome to the Mostly Pod of the Night, Mostly. I am Graveyard, joined by my co-host, Salem. Hello. This is episode eight of our weekly All Things Horror podcast. Our topic for this week is the Massacre Horror Movie Marathon Convention that was last night, October twenty October 1st, 2022, at the Davis Theater in Chicago, where we were lucky enough to sponsor the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So Salem and I were both there last night. Um and we're just going to kind of go over, you know, our thoughts uh, of, you know, the overall experience that we had, the movies that we watched, and everything that goes with it. So, let's dive in first to the movies that we were stuck around to watch. Now, this was a 14-hour event. Um, we did not stay the entire time; it was a long time, and we just couldn't get everything in there that we would have. Um, you know, would we stay there next year the entire time? Do you think, Salem, if we plan it out and they're able to get dogs taken care of and kids and stuff like that? Um, yeah, as long as I have somebody to watch the dog, yeah, I'd, I'd be fine with that. But yeah, if, okay. if, I, if I leave for that long, my dog will be very upset. Right. And kind of, you know, another thing that we were going to do, which is this upcoming weekend, was the, the drive-in one, which we didn't realize was a four-hour drive one way and a two-night event. We thought it was closer to us. Um, hopefully that maybe next year we can plan that out as well. Maybe it'll be closer to us next year as well, hopefully. Um, but I'm in contact with the guys who ran this, and we'll see from there. Yeah, it's kind of a bummer because, I mean, they had a lot of good movies there. Like I was, yeah, Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah, the timing was a little off. I mean, but if I'm, like, you know, staying in a hotel room right next to the place, that's not too bad. But, like, Videodrome, which... You know, one of my favorite movies was playing at like three o'clock in the morning. Right. I don't know if I if I can stay up that long. <laughs> I will try, but I don't know if I can. I'm getting old. Yeah, I mean, what it was eight supposed to be eight hours, or was it twelve hours a day for two days? So it was twenty four hours altogether. Um. Yeah. Well, I mean, because yeah, driving you're limited to night, so you have to wait for the sun to go down. So it's like, yeah, I think it, it's like eight o'clock to like yeah, it look it looked like to like five in the morning. Right. So yeah, and that's just that was just the movie part. Um, I haven't been to a drive-in. I don't know if there would be vendors. If it's actually a drive-in versus the Davis Theater, where it's an actual theater. Oh, uh, the one the one out there is a drive-in. I've never been there, but it, I've I've looked it up. Um, and it and it is an actual drive-in where you drive in and you get the little, you know, you sit in your car and you know watch it and stuff like that. I don't know what other amenities they have there. I've never been to a convention at a drive-in. I have been to a drive-in. But I have not been to a convention in a drive-in, so I can't speak to that. But um, I have been in a in a drive-in. I did I did go see uh, the original Total Recall in a drive-in. Oh wow! So, yeah, our our last drive-in by me was shut down years ago, and I thought it'd always cool to go do it. I'm, I'm interested, you know, because it's the same same group that did you know the the massacre last night that's doing the same thing next weekend. Um, there seems to be more, you know, movies, and they were all different from the, you know, the schedule layout and stuff like that too. Yeah, like I said, the schedules look great. It just, yeah, I just, I did, I didn't realize how far away they were. <laughs> right, it, it was poor plan on our part, but you know, we'll be prepared for next year. Um, yeah. I already got, I already got the okay from the wife to do it next year. <laughs> it's on that. Just need a dog sitter. We'll see. Right. All right. So let's get into the movies that we watch. You know, these. The three movies that we stayed and watched, you know, were Child's Play Two, the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and the original The Howling. Um, and we'll get more into depth of these movies when we go into the full franchise review because these are all part of bigger franchises. Um, but let's start with Child's Play Two. When is the last time you saw Child's Play Two, or if you even recall seeing Child's Play Two? Um, I mean, I have watched Child's Play Two. I honestly, I probably haven't seen it in 20 years. I mean, it's been a long time. I probably, last time I watched it, it was on VHS. If that tells <laughs> you how long ago it was. Right. So I, I, let's just get, we can get briefly into the plot. Like I said, not, not a long summarization, but just a quick synopsis of it. You know, so, you know, Child's Play 1 ends with essentially Chucky getting shot multiple times, you know, part of his limbs are blown off by the cop who was, um, I believe, uh, Prince Humperdinck from Princess Bride. (laughs) (laughs) 
Um, and, you know, shot through the heart, kind of majorly burn the set on fire. And the company uh, that makes the good guy dolls took him back because there's reports of this happening. I believe this takes place. This is Chicago. Yeah, it's Lakeshore Strangler. Um, and so they're going, hey, we don't believe this. And something that I completely forgot was how Chucky comes back in this movie. It's been a while for me. And I didn't realize how long it's been rewatching these. I think I've watched the newer ones more recently. Obviously, they're newer than going back with this. But essentially, he gets he gets rebuilt for some reason. I they don't really go into okay. the reason behind it. Now listen, this is this is like one of the loosest, I mean like reasons <laughs> for for like a villain coming back ever. They did actually try to explain it. And they actually said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to own the PR on this by getting the original doll and rebuilding it and showing people that it's not haunted. That was literally what they said. Okay. I mean, if that is not the loosest, dumbest reason to bring back, I mean, it's a doll, dude. Just throw it away. <laughs> right. And what's really weird is, you know, as, as, Chucky or Charles Lee Ray, the, the late for a strangler, is in the good guy doll, the more human becomes. So he gets blood and stuff like that. And he, you know, a human would get lost blood, but they reinvigorate the essence, I guess, with new parts. And then he gets shocked through the, when his eyes get put in, he gets electrical shock and like the, reunites the voodoo spell that uh, Chucky had on the doll. Right. I mean, but I mean, look at the man hours it took to manually create. Like, they even made a comment, like, we're not used to manually making these. We have machines that do it. Like, the man hours required to, like, clean up a, like, melted, burnt, shot up doll to, like, make it whole again. Like, why? Why would you ever do that? No one cares. Right. I mean, they could have just taken any old doll and said, this is the doll. See, there's nothing wrong or, with Or it. just don't say anything at all and just let it go. I mean, like, the PR of saying, hey, look, this is the doll that we rebuilt. Like, what, what sick, like, ass would do that? I mean, everybody, everybody <laughs> would look at you like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> like, why would you do that? Right. That's so, like saying, like, oh, you know, oh, the apartment that Dahmer killed people in. Oh, look. We're just going to reupholster everything and, <laughs> and show it off. Oh, look, look, this is a great apartment, right? Don't you want to live here? Like, no, nobody, like, you just got to let it go. You let, let time take over. And then eventually people will forget. Right. So, I mean, he goes back into it and then he still claims that he still has time and he needs to get, you know, do the voodoo soul exchange with, with Andy and get back to the body. So he's still in Chicago. Andy's still in Chicago. Uh, and they go, he just finds him. He goes, you know, Andy's mom gets put in a psych ward because she collaborated and corroborated his story. He goes into foster care. And then Chucky knows to go to, I mean, the file, the company had the file on Andy. So they say this is where he's at just for PR, you know, maintaining and just kind of cover this up where like three people died. Um, and then, you know, goes there, finds him, and then starts tracking Andy down and, you know, it just so happens to be a good guy doll at the foster home that Andy's at. And then we meet, you know, his foster sister. Oh, I can't think of her name. Her real name? Uh, no, the, her character. Her character. Name. Oh, Kyle. Was Kyle. Yeah, that's right. Kyle. You know, and just more stuff starts happening again, you know, not knowing if it's Chucky or not. And, you know, the, you know, the foster parents eventually get killed. The very strict school teacher that you know, like the one day that Andy was at school, which he seemed very new. But if he's in Chicago, couldn't he have gone to the same school as he was going to? I didn't get well, that. Like, why was he going to a different school? I mean, you move to a different neighborhood; they're not going to bus you to another school, especially if you're in the foster system. Like, you're you're stuck with whatever they give you. I mean, if you're in the foster system, you'd think that maybe you'd try to stick to the same school, especially if we stay in the same area. Well, I mean, if a kid suffers a traumatic event like that, they try to, like, give them a break from where they're at. Right. You know what I mean? Especially if they don't know what triggered it. I, I highly doubt they would have put a kid with severe troubles like that in school so fast, but... Right. 
plot device, I guess. Right. And I, I'm wondering if the mom didn't want to come back for the sequel. So they just kind of wrote her character off and say, Oh, she's oh, that's, that's exactly what happened. I guarantee <laughs> that's exactly what happened. Right. So, you know, Alex Vincent came back as, as Andy is only a year later after child's play, which is good because child actors tend to grow up really, really fast between years of movies. Um, and, you know, Chucky kills the foster parents, goes after Andy. They eventually essentially do a giant U-turn or a circle of going back to the good guy factory. And the warehouse is ginormous. And I'm not sure the production's that high on the good guy doll. I mean, they seem like it's very rare in the first one. You know, there's like, you know, how'd the mom get her hands on the good guy doll in the first movie? Well, it was but, like Cabbage Patch Kids. I mean, they were hard to get, but there was a lot of them. It's just that everyone wanted one. And I find it, I don't think a factory like that would have the line running nonstop. I, mean, I, I can't imagine the demand was that high. I I mean, I, yeah, I don't know. In this fictional world, sure, why not? I mean, in this right. fictional world, we could say that was the Cabbage Patch of the time. And if that's the case, then sure. Right. Uh, you know, they have, don't don't look at that factory next year because it'll probably be shut down. <laughs> correct. Because <laughs> it's yeah, it goes in fads. Yeah. So, um, you know, they're going through the warehouse. They're seeing how the dolls are made. They're seeing how, which I I guess I don't get. Like they sh- the the body, the torso of the doll would go into like a steamer and then get the arms and legs applied, which was just plastic nubs that I'm not sure you really needed to heat it to just insert the sockets. I mean, you you don't. I mean, this whole thing was just an obstacle course that they built for effects. That's all, that's the only reason it was there. It's very big, very bright, very colorful. Right. Very grandiose in, in the scheme of things. Um, you know, and there was one maintenance guy that was there and took like five, you know, there's an assembly line going on, the, the eye insertion which was like a trap they had to go through so they wouldn't get the eyes jammed into them, which was seems like a very hard machine to do something as gentle as putting eyes in there, like jamming it into it like there's no tomorrow. Um, and then, you know, five good guy dolls get jammed, and the alarm goes off, and he's like, oh, why do I have to do anything? Like, one guy for maintenance of an entire production line? You know, something like that would happen. You know, everything else was still moving, which I didn't think would happen if there was a a stop in the assembly line, I would think everything else would shut down. Okay, well, let's let's just skate right past the issue where everyone has free access to this warehouse and there's zero security. Yeah. Like, if you're talking, this is, this is the Cabbage Patch warehouse, there will be people trying to break in to steal Cabbage Patch kids. It will happen. You need to have locked doors, you need to have security, and I guarantee you they did back in those days. It doesn't make any sense that there's no security. All the doors are unlocked. The only guy in the building, they show cameras behind him. I mean, they show that, oh, he's not paying attention to them. But I mean, how hard is it to pay attention to like people running and screaming and knocking over all the boxes and shit on a camera? I mean, anybody would catch that. Doesn't even, if you're asleep, you'd catch that. I mean, I guess that's a fair point because when one of my first jobs, I was overnight knock technician and I had to watch the cameras and do sweeps of the floor of the building, which is like a three or four building on top of the job. And yeah, I mean, there's lots of screens and you know, I don't think I'd get upset if like, Oh, I have to do something like I understand it's supposed to be this big automated process, but you know, he tightened something like three times and pushed the button and then reset it. It was, it was a weird, oh. it was a weird thing. I don't just understand. I don't think the assembly line was necessarily like portrayed obviously accurately well yeah i mean yeah if you've ever been in an assembly line yeah there's a lot of robots doing shit but there is still people there because you still have to visually check it because sometimes with machines will be like oh yeah and everything's good and then you go down there and everything's a big pile of you know like everything's junked and destroyed but you know the line still thinks it's fine and also if you stop the line it stops every part of the line because it's it's all connected. You can't just stop one section because then you're just going to get a huge pile of stuff waiting to go in. You know, 
Again, yeah. It's somebody that had never been in a factory assembly line designed all the effects. I get they just did it for the effects. I mean, they're, you know, they have like the, the steam chamber so that, you know, Chucky gets trapped and hurt in there. They have like, the, you know, the, the liquid plastic that burns and melts and explodes. And, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's right. just, it's all there for just, you know, set pieces for the, the fight. And that, that's it. That's all it was. They, they weren't thinking of how a factory actually works. Right. So, you know, kind of the idea was they were the way that Chucky ended this this movie was, you know, there he's he's chasing after them. A grate falls down and he has to rip his hand off. And he's like fully human at that point in time where he's realized that he can't transfer his soul. He's trapped in the body and just like his hand rips off. And then just to, you know, shove a knife into your arm just seemed weird to go after him, but then they trap him, they realize that the steamer thing exists, you know, he gets hair stapled onto his pants on the board, gets put into the steamer and just gets like multiple arms and legs jammed into him, which would be pretty painful, obviously, as a human. Uh, But, you know, he's kind of then half burnt, and he kind of comes back, his legs are torn off, he's missing a hand, he's you know, riding on a, a you know board with wheels with one hand, and then you know we was we'll discuss it briefly. Is we'll get to that. Is didn't really get to see the end of how he dies, right? I know how it ends. Is that you know earlier they show um, Kyle bumping into that just very very poor valve that's attached to the hot liquid plastic. You know, just no safety overrides. Nothing that was just there to briefly knocked into it and there's just drips and almost falls on Andy and then they release it and melt you know Chucky to the floor and that's how it ends right I mean that that has got to be the world's worst valve I've ever seen well again it, all this was just made for um, you know a set pieces for the, the finale that's it that's all that's all it was yeah, and I honestly don't. Well, just like I said, I'll briefly touch on it, but when we get into the franchise, but I'll say the next part how he comes back after this is then they take this melted plastic hunk, hunk remelt it down, and make more good guy dolls from it. And that's how he comes back in the next one. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah, like, I mean, how hard is it to buy other plastic? I mean, it's scrap. Come on. It's scrap yeah. at that point. Like, when they, that's another PR cover-up because now there's a dead guy with fake plastic eyes in his head that was swinging well, okay. from a rope. Yeah. <laughs> a death happens on the line. There's blood everywhere. There's obviously like viscera mixed in their plastic. They would shut the whole line down. They would bring in a team to sanitize and clean everything, and they would start all over with new product. That's fact. Right. <laughs> Right. They would not reuse anything. No company is that desperate to reuse plastic. Right. It's like taking slag as a, a you know, steel mill and like, we'll reuse the slag. No, you don't do that. That's garbage. It's junk. It's runoff. You don't reuse it, let alone blood everywhere. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's again, <laughs> if you've ever worked in any kind of industry at all, you realize how these things work. And I mean, I understand you need a reason for the sequel, and that's the only reason they can think of, but. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Right. Um, so we can discuss a little bit technical issues that happened while we're watching this, right? I don't know what media was being used, but we were probably, it seemed like a, a DVD chapter type issue that occurred, right? Like DVD had a bad part, and there's probably like the last two chapters on the DVD, and like it stopped. Took a while to get it back. We had to rewatch the next like the last 15 minutes again and then like got a second farther stopped and then we got to the end <laughs> so we missed yeah. kind of like the last chapter of it right yeah it skipped from uh yeah where he stuck his knife in the little radiator thing right and then it jumped to him exploding <laughs> after being filled up with plastic so i mean not a huge no. you know chunk of time but yeah enough but yeah and also that the, the last section had no sound either it was just correct like, yeah oh yeah i forgot they also yeah he gets melted and then the uh air pipe gets shoved into his mouth and blows up and yeah it was yeah. an interesting way it seemed like a bigger 
better way of getting rid of him from the first one. It's just like a more grandiose way of killing it. Like, I, I, it's kind of what happens in sequels, right? You have to outdo the death of the same thing. You can't have the villain die if they die the same way every time. Yeah, and I'm I'm pretty sure half of that movie's budget was spent on building that factory. Probably. That, that factory was way more elaborate than it needed to be. I'm pretty sure they spent more on that than they did on everything else. Right. Growing up, I don't think, when I first saw Child's Play, I don't recall it being Chicago-based. I don't think I really put that together when I first watched it. Um, yeah, at, at the time, I don't remember it. I mean, there's a lot of stuff. There's like, you know, the Sun-Times is the newspaper that they read. Like, they're actually, they jump in the back of the Sun-Times truck, you know? Right. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's it's obviously there now, but back then, I don't know if I noticed. I probably did, and I just forgot. It's not a major thing. Yeah, but I mean, it's pretty cool, though, that we were in Chicago watching stuff made in Chicago. I kind of like stuff like that. You know, I, I do enjoy... You know, Ferris Bueller's Day Off takes place in Chicago. There, there's Blues Brothers is Chicago. Yep. Yeah. You know, so it's it's interesting watching some of the stuff. I mean, they don't really show much of Chicago. Chicago really hasn't changed much from 1989 to now, especially like stuff that we saw. Warehouse District. I mean, there's tons in Chicago. Right. But I mean, yeah, other than weird. other than the technical issue, which it happens, right? We, we're all well used to stuff like that happening. Though, I mean, there was. What did you think of the crowd with this movie? Um, I mean, it's it's your your typical fan crowd. So where they, you know, they clap, you know, whenever there's something, you know, like a one liner is said, or they clap when like a a death happens, or you know, they laugh when something goofy happens. I mean, it's. It's a typical crowd for this kind of, you know, for like a cult classic movie, I would say. Yeah. I mean, I, it's, I found out, I didn't realize that this, this event was sold out. I mean, I couldn't imagine more people there. Every seat was filled. They had seats kind of in the aisles too, just to get more seat in there. Right. Uh, but this was, I was discussing with the wife this morning. Um, and we briefly discussed our drive up there was that I don't th- I, I I know I saw Seed of Chucky in theaters, and then anything after that never came into theaters other than the new one. Um, so saw Seed of Chucky in theaters. It was two thousand three ish. I so said the new Child's Play a couple years ago. The re the the remake came out in theaters. Did not see that. So this is only my second. Chucky or Child's Play movie in theaters. Was this your first? Uh, no, I believe I believe I saw Bride of Chucky in the theater. Okay, um, because it was at a time period where I was working at a movie theater, and I basically saw every movie that came out during that time frame, just because I could. Right. So I'm pretty sure I watched it at that time. I mean, I had seen all the other child's play up to that point, but I don't, I didn't see any of those in the theater. I saw that one in the theater because it was free. So, yeah, I mean, it's it about the, you know, Brian Chucky came out in about 1998. Um, see, Chucky was 2002, 2003, I believe. Something like that. So that was in the time frame where you weren't watching horror movies. That's the time frame. I was seeing every horror movie in theaters. I possibly could. Right. So, no, I mean, I, I, I like Child's Play enough to, you know, really, you know, we pick, we sat down and we discerned what we're going to go and watch. And I think this was a good thing to watch. Obviously, I, we, I think you said that the Howling and Child's Play were switched originally on the schedule and they switched it back. Yeah, yeah. It was originally Howling at six and then Child's Play two after Chainsaw, but they switched it like a week before. Right. I, I I think the idea was that during Child's Play, we were going to go talk to all the vendors at that point, but they switched it. We really wanted to stay for the howling, obviously. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, uh, it, like I said, it was the first time, first movie for me at a marathon, at an event, you know, discuss, we'll discuss the crowd and, and the people in it, you know, kind of later on in, in this podcast. Uh, do you want to go over the next movie? I know it's one of your favorites. 
<laughs> uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Um, I mean, there's there's not a whole lot to that plot, really. <laughs> um, basically, it it starts with, um, yeah, like news reports of like somebody broke into a cemetery and like dug up a bunch of people and like rearranged them in like weirdly artistic ways. Um, so the it's like essentially two couples. And then the one girl's um, brother, who is, is yes. disabled in a wheelchair, I think he's just annoying. I don't think he's supposed to be like, like, like what mentally ill in any or challenged in any way. I think he's just annoying. I don't, oh, I don't he's, think he's Fra- Franklin's very annoying. <laughs> yeah, I mean he's just an annoying character, but I don't think he was supposed to be, you know, like uh, mentally disabled in any way. I think he was just you know, physically disabled as he was in a wheelchair. I, I'm pretty sure that was it. But, um, I mean, he kind of comes off as, as, you know, dumb, but I think that's just <laughs> him as a character. I don't think it was, I don't, th- I don't think it was a disability in any way. Um, but anyway, so there's, there's t- two couples that go up there and then the, the sister and then her, you know, uh, disabled brother. Now th- her and the disabled brother, they were, their grandfather was buried in that cemetery. So they go to just make sure that the grandfather's grave is okay. And it is. Um, and then since they're out there, they decide to go like check out the old family homestead, right? Which they had not been in for a very long time, but they were there as children and they're what your early twenties ish college age, right? I was, I was thinking it had been 10 to 14 years since they're there last. Yeah, but, but they were kids. They said, so, like, they, said a, they said about eight they're there. Yeah. Or, or at least one ten, of them or, was. Or, or, they, or they said it had been like 10 years since they've been there. Right. So, yeah, college age. It's if they were like 20 ish, right? Yeah. Yeah. Makes um, sense. So, right. So, yeah. So, they're, you know, they decided to go check out this old homestead that their grandparents had, you know, that they went to as kids to kind of revisit, blah, blah. So, they go out there. Um, and they end up, you know, as they, they leave the thing, they pick up this, you know, weird hitchhiker guy who's obviously has issues, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, he's got like a like a pouch made out of what, like a raccoon or like a squirrel or something. I don't know. It's it's weird looking. His bag um, of holding. <laughs> yeah, and he's like obsessed with like a camera, and then he takes the the brother's knife and like cuts his hand open, and they're all just like watching this. Like this is this guy needs to go, you know. And they eventually like get the guy out of the van and he like rubs his bleeding hand all over the side of the van as they're leaving. So they're going to the gas station, right? Cause they need gas. Um, and the guy says, Oh yeah, we don't have any gas. So either you have to wait for gas or, you know, uh, go to the next or, no, yeah, station. Yeah. Or yeah. Well, yeah, but he wouldn't say where the next one was or he didn't know or whatever it was. Yeah. So they're like, okay, we got to wait for gas anyway. So we're just going to go to that old homestead because it should be close to here. And then we'll go back and get gas later. <clears throat> um, so they go to the old homestead and they're like, you know, screwing around in there. Uh, the one dude's in a wheelchair. So obviously he can't go up the stairs. They're all hanging out upstairs. So he gets kind of, you know, upset and, you know, squealing and just being annoying. <laughs> Um, and then the two, the one couple decides to like, you know, oh, we're going to go to the old swimming hole you were talking about, you know, and he's, you know, he says, oh, there's, a, you know, the old trail back behind the shed. In the two so sheds, go, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they go, you know, they go down there and they're walking they can't find any swimming hole, but they find another house or they hear like a generator in a house. So they're like, oh, maybe we get gas from these people because there's a generator. Running. So they go up to this house. Um, you know, it's a creepy looking house with all kinds of weird bones, sculptures and stuff. Why? Why it's a good idea to knock on that door, I don't know. <laughs> but they do. Uh, nobody answers. Bang, bang, bang. Scream, scream, scream. Nobody's answering. So, of course, they decide to walk in the house. <laughs> um, the guy walks in the house. Of course, the girl was like, got upset at him for something. Um, what did he, he scared her with something. Yeah. I don't remember what it was. But it was something. He scared her with something. And she left. So he walked in the house. Um, <laughs> Leatherface comes out, grabs him, like, you know, hits him in the head with a hammer and then closes this door to his little room, slaughter room, right? Um, so she eventually realizes he's not coming back, goes up, she's looking, oh, you know, where is the guy? Where's the guy? She goes in there. Um, you know, she wanders in <laughs> to what we'll call the chicken room. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and there's, you know, all kinds of weird bones, sculptures, and stuff. And she's like, you know, retching because it's all gross and 
And uh, Leatherface comes in and, and grabs her. There's a little bit, there's a lot of screaming involved, whatever. He hangs her up on a hook and starts cutting him up with a chainsaw. Um, so then we cut back to, um, you know, there's there's still the one couple and the, you know, with the sister and the brother, right? So the one guy says, hey, you know, they haven't come back in a while. I should go look for him." <laughs> so he goes off to look for him. Um, you know, he goes in the house, you know, basically the same kind of thing happens to him where, you know, he gets, you know, captured and shit as well. Right. Um, so it gets dark. Um, and then there's the brother and the sister and they're like, oh, you know, they're, they're not out there. They're like honking the horn and, you know, nobody's responding. So they're like, well, you know, we got to go find them because we don't even have the keys to the car to get out of here. So they go down to the house. Um, of course. Well, they don't even, no, they don't even get to the house. They're screaming and, and like yelling and she's trying to push his wheelchair through like this forest, which is not going well. Um, and they're both yelling at each other. They're yelling for their you know, friends and stuff. And, and of course, because they're making so much noise and, you know, with the flashlight and stuff, like Leatherface comes out and gets them. Um, and then, of course, chainsaws the brother in the wheelchair first. Now, I was very surprised that people did not clap in the theater when he got killed. Because it's the only kill with because, the chainsaw? Well, yeah, it was the only kill that like you see on screen with the chainsaw, but also he's like annoying, right? Like he is a very annoying character. And usually when the annoying character dies, people clap and there's like there's no sound at all. So I think it might have been people were afraid to clap because he was, you know, like in the wheelchair, you know? So they're like, you know, just the We'll just we'll just not do anything. We'll just let this one pass, right? Which is fair. Um, so then, of course, he's chasing her through the forest. You know, he's chainsawing through all the trees that she's running through, and um, she ends up running in the house. And she runs upstairs and sees a dead old grandma and what appears to be dead old grandpa. <laughs> um. You know, she tries to lock the door. Leatherface, of course, just chainsaws through the door. Well, he doesn't uh, chainsaw eventually- through it. He chains through part of it and then just knocks it open. <laughs> well, he, he he well he cuts like a V into the door. I mean, he's yeah. maybe he's doing it for intimidation. Who knows? Right. Um, so eventually, she gets away. She runs back down to the gas station, which is apparently close enough to run to. I didn't think it was that close, but. And Leatherface was running the same distance, the same speed, which is pretty good for a guy his size. Yeah, I know. Like, I mean, he's got a lot of stamina for a big dude. I mean, he's he's given us a good name. Yeah. He runs. He runs a lot in this movie. Like, I don't think he's ever not running, except when he's like sitting down at the table. Right. Um, but yeah, no, he he does a good job. He's a champ. Uh, so she goes to the gas station. The guy's like, oh, you know, come on in. You know, you know, oh, I don't have a phone to call the cops, you know, just like I don't have gas. Um, but, you know, we'll we'll go, you know, get in my truck and we'll go, you know, uh, to the to the police station. And, of course, he goes and gets his truck and he comes back with a sack and some rope. I mean, <laughs> you know, so, yeah, not not good. He ties her up, puts her in the bag, goes back up to the house. And, of course, creepy hitchhiker is is the brother of. Leatherface and this creepy, you know, gas station dude is their dad, right? Yeah. Um, is their dad, right? Yeah. I, I'm pretty, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, is their dad. So then they bring her up there and they tie her up, and, and the rest of the movie is pretty much like her screaming nonstop. I mean, other things are happening. People are talking over her screaming, but I think the screaming just continues on for the whole rest of it. Screaming or crying for at least 20 minutes. Right, right, right. Um, Yeah, so they basically like tie her up and they're like she's sitting at the like the dinner table with like you know the the dad, the gas station guy, the creepy hitchhiker dude and Leatherface who has now put on somebody else's face and somebody else's like whole hair head, right? Like the whole top of their head with the hair still on it. And a shawl, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, at, at one point it looks like he's wearing like a like a power dress with like a like a like a lacy ascot, but then later on he's just wearing a suit. So I think it it was just like this suit. It is the seventies, so it might have just been how the suit looked at that time. Um, so yeah, so they're like you know they're trying to eat and they're just messing with her, you know, and they're like arguing amongst themselves, um, and they decide that they're gonna let Grandpa actually you know kill this one right and i mean he just looks like a corpse for most of this until like they cut her finger and let him like suck on it and then he's actually like moving around and it's like 
it's weird because again, he looks dead. <laughs> you assume he's actually dead, but no, he's still barely alive. Um, and so they're trying to like, you know, put the hammer in his hand and let him hit her with the hammer. And he hits her a couple of times, barely, but you know, not, you know, not hard enough to actually do any real damage. And she ends up just escaping and running away. <laughs> um, and of course the hitchhiker dude, he's fast. I mean, he's like running circles around her, just messing with her. Leatherface is doing his best to keep up with her with the chainsaw again. Um, she runs into the highway. Um, there, she does find a trucker in the highway who runs over the creepy hitchhiker brother. So he's out. Um, she <laughs> runs up to the door. He runs out. You know, the truck driver gets out going like, Hey, what's going on? And he sees the chainsaw and he immediately runs right back in the truck. I mean, as you, as you should. Right. Um, yeah, they, he doesn't try to drive away. He just like gets out of the other side because Leatherface is like trying to chainsaw through the door. And then they're running away. And then, you know, Leatherface trips and falls, cuts his own leg with the chainsaw. And then now he's limping down the street and they end up um, jumping in another pickup truck that drives by and they get away. And then Leatherface just screams and like you know does this weird interpretive dance with his chainsaw in the middle of the street and then the movie's over i mean the trucker another big dude running really fast <laughs> yeah again doing us <laughs> proud doing us proud in the texas heat i mean uh, right. now here here is the interesting question that i was thinking of the entire time i was watching this right yeah under texas's current castle doctrine and hold your ground laws did they actually break the law the family did the family break the law right right i mean they i mean three of them four of them broke into their home right the first three are definite like home invasions and they stopped them i mean obviously the the eating people but that's a separate charge i'm saying the actual murder charges the attack charges that they would get you know like is it would they actually be <laughs> breaking the law? Because like the hold your ground castle doctrine is like if somebody breaks in your house, you have the right to to fight them off, right? So like yeah, the first three, there's no contest. They were killed in the house. They had broken into the house. Um, the fourth one also broke into the house. That one is pretty cut and dry. The brother in the wheelchair was still on their property. I mean, I guess that one's debatable, but it is on their property, right? Yeah. Um, and then the other one, I mean, I guess there would be kidnapping charges involved because she did go to a like a public gas station. Correct. And stuff like that. So the last one they would definitely get charged for. But the rest of those, would they actually get charged for anything other, you know, because of the of the, the current laws in Texas, would they actually get in trouble for this? Good question. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of. I'm like, huh. Like they broke into their house. They kind of have <laughs> At least by Texas law, they have the right to fight them off. Obviously, they, you know, eating them, butchering them, you know, those are separate charges, you know, like mutilation of a body and you know, right. cannibalism. Those are separate charges, but the actual murder charges, they might not be indicted for. Yeah. Oh, did the truck driver get into the other truck or did he just keep running? I don't recall. Yeah, I don't, he there. just disappeared. He just he just ran right out of the screen. I mean, he just ran. He ran for his life and he left the movie, he ran right out of the movie. Never comes back for a legacy revival. That's a shame. <laughs> <laughs> no, I want. He did, I want he's his, probably still running. <laughs> <laughs> I want his story now. <laughs> <laughs> right. He's probably still running. I don't know if I saw some dude wearing somebody else's face for a mask with a chainsaw running after me. Yeah, I wouldn't. Nope. Did he say? Did he either. say anything? Uh <laughs> yeah, he did. He went. He went. Oh shit! <laughs> and that's that's it. But that was it. That was all he said. So, so he did. He did get a speaking line technically, but that was that was all. And we'll rewatch we'll this like, again when we do the, you know, read the franchise as a whole with the new one. A well, new one just came out. We have to catch up to get that. Um, mm-hmm. Do you find it weird that the dad also had like a little apartment at the gas station as well as his homestead? Was that just to kind of throw you off? 
Well, okay. I, if you say, you know, when they're sitting at the table, there's obviously more to that conversation. Like I said, they're messing with each other. Like the weird hitchhiker brother and Leatherface are obviously, they're telling him that he's too weak to do the actual killing. And he agrees. And he says, I'm just, I just don't get into the killing part of it. He's just, he, he's just the cook. Right. And so I think they do a lot of weird shit at that house. And I don't think he wants to be there, honestly. So I think that's why he has his own place. And like he cooks his own food and everything at that place. You know, he's probably selling their human barbecue. Right. <laughs> I, 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 um, that was, I think that was the implication, right? You couldn't tell right. what in his smoker, what was potentially human in there. Right. There, there's questionable meats. Let's go with that. <laughs> yeah. There was, there was actually a, a real life serial killer that did that. Oh, this is uh, based off of Ed Gein. Well, no, this is a totally different guy, not Ed Gein. Oh, uh, Leatherface is based on Ed Gein. Yes, I'm not I'm not, <laughs> this, I'm not saying you're wrong there. I'm just saying there is a, another serial killer. I don't remember his name. Um, he was a bigger dude, but he would um, kill women and then he would grind them up, and he would make and he had his own like roadside barbecue stand, and he would like make burgers and sausages and stuff out of the people and sell them. Um, now he said that he did that. He did admit to it, but they never actually found samples of it. So they haven't been able to like verify that he did, but he says that he did. And there's bodies that they can't find that they can only assume that that's what he did with them. Yeah. I don't remember. I don't remember his name, but I, like I said, I remember he was a bigger dude. I mean, it was, we're not talking about John Wick AC. No. Dahmer only did it to men. Right. Well, yeah, he, that was for his own personal use, but this guy actually like sold it to people. Or I get, like I said, he confessed to doing that, and he did actually have a roadside barbecue stand, and he did actually kill women as a serial killer. They they have all the evidence of all that. They just don't have evidence of the actual barbecue that he sold containing human meat because they didn't catch him at a time where he had any there. Right. Huh. I'm just I'm I was just looking it up. I don't, was it in America or was it someplace else? It was America. Okay. I mean, was this before or after Texas Chainsaw? This was after. Okay, so after the seventies. Yeah, I, yeah. No, the, the movie wasn't based on it. I'm just saying there is a real life, <laughs> you know, kind of connection there as to where it happened. That's so bizarre. I know you. I know you listen to the True Crime podcast more than I do. Mm-hmm. Was that one of them? Um, probably. <laughs> that's, that's usually where I get. So usually where I get all that information. I said we'll we'll discuss this more, but I just you know for a movie called Texas Chainsaw Massacre, he used a chainsaw on it was it Terry to cut him up. Very, very not gory for from what I remember. Like you know came out 48 years ago. I mean, there's there's blood, but overall, it, it wasn't a very gory movie. It wasn't very visceral. You know, with, with, with Franklin, when he got... I mean, he was getting sliced up and stabbed through and don't see any of it. Well, yeah, because it was in, at, the, in, at the... Sorry, it was in the dark. Right. Um, sorry, it's Joe Metheny is the guy's name. Okay. Never heard of it. Yeah, it, yeah it's, it said Joe Metheny confessed to an array of transgressions that included eating and grinding up his victims' body parts, which he would then mix with pork and beef that he served to customers at his roadside open pit barbecue stand. And it was in uh, but the late nineties. Interesting. So that was even after the creep sh- uh, uh, Tales from the Crypt episode with uh, Christopher Reeves that had a diner that they. Uh, Judd Nelson, they did that too. They'd serve up steaks from his body. Yep. That's a very distinct episode. I remember that. (laughs) (laughs) Right. All right. So, I mean, Text Chainsaw, like I said, this is for me. I saw uh, the Text Chainsaw Massacre 2003 with Jessica Beale. I want to say a new, the one after that, which was a prequel beginnings, both with Arlie Emery as the sheriff. Mm -hmm. Those were the only two I had seen in the theaters. This is my first time seeing the original in theaters. What about you? 
Yeah, this is it's the first time I've seen this one in the theater, and it's the first time I've seen any of them in a the theater. Okay. Um, I've seen all of them except for the very newest one, which I think just came out the last year or two. I think this year. Yeah, so I, I haven't seen that one yet, but I have seen all the rest of them. Yeah, I'm missing uh, the one this year, and then uh, Leatherface, or was it called Pig? Was it two? Was Pig one of them? Pig? No, Pig is a Nicolas Cage movie. Because I feel like we're missing another one in there. I thought that was about that. Uh, I don't remember. We'll, but, yeah, we'll discuss it. Um, but when's the last time you saw a Texas Chainsaw Massacre? The original one. I mean, again, this is it's going to go back to around the same time period where I watched all the child plays. So um, it's going to be back in VHS days. I, I watched it back when it was on VHS. So we're probably talking. Um, yeah, this is late nineties. Yeah, on VHS was probably when I watched the first. I think four because I think the first four were out at that time. Right. Oh, there's yeah. the recent one between the beginning and Leatherface in 3D. I don't recall if I saw that one. Like I said, I'm pretty sure I've seen them all okay. except for the newest one. Yeah, that came out February of this year. Yeah. Now, yeah, I'm gonna. And when we get to that, I'm going to rewatch them. Obviously. Oh, yeah. And I, right. I will probably discover that, that I didn't see one of them because it's been <laughs> happening with all of these so far. But right. I'm, at this point in time, <laughs> I'm fairly <laughs> confident I've seen all of them except for the last one, but I will probably be proven wrong when I watch them. Yeah. Like I said, it, it, I'm probably with you. Is I think I rewatched all of them and prepped for the 2003 one. I want to say that was the last time I watched any of them. Well, after the beginning, I don't think I saw 3D. It's not. It's just not one of my rewatches right now. So going back to this, you know, we were we reached out to the venue a couple of weeks ago, right, or was it a month ago? You know, we saw that they were sponsors, and I just inquired just to see how for next year the idea of that we would be able to sponsor something like. You know, once we get, we'll have almost be like our year anniversary of doing this by then, um, and everything like that. And you know, reached out to them through Facebook, and they said, "Hey, we're having a sponsorship available." Uh, and you know, of the three movies, I think we were able to we we got lucky and got the one we both probably would have preferred, right? Which was Texas Chainsaw Massacre that we became a sponsor for it, which is pretty cool. You know, we came with merchandise and stuff like that, and. Uh, I missed the first shout out because uh, I was wandering, trying to look at the vendor and stuff like that, just between Child's Play and Text Chainsaw. So, what I was actually surprised with with the Text Chainsaw Massacre is that we had John Dugan show up, that he was at this thing, right? And I never, I mean, I don't know much of his acting credits, but still to have, and for those listening, John Dugan is grandpa. He he was the guy, you know, in the in the prosthetics and the chair, and I don't think he had any lines, but more just a motion actor at that point in time for this movie. Yeah, unless you count like suckling noises, <laughs> that's the only right, the only like noises he makes. Right. Um. So, I mean, you've been to conventions before, but have they had anyone in the movies that were that you see? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, everyone you go to, they have at least one person. Okay. Um, like I went to um, uh, the last one I went to, the Sci-Fi Spectacular. When I went to, they had uh Vernon Wells. Okay. Who is uh for whoever doesn't know who that is, he's the the Mohawk dude, the bad guy on the motorcycle in Road Warrior. That's that's Vernon Wells. He was in um he was the bad guy in Inner Space. <laughs> if you ever saw that movie, wow, that's um, I have not watched that in a very long time. <laughs> he's also the he also the bad guy in Commando. Okay, where he looks like <laughs> everybody always says he looks like the fat Freddie Mercury in that movie. <laughs> that's fair. Um, yeah, but that's yeah, that's also that's Vernon Wells. I think those are like the three movies that he was in. Okay. I mean, he's been in other stuff, but those are the, like, at that time, that was like the peak of his, <laughs> yeah. his you know, noticeability in his, his career there. But, um, 
Yeah, so he was there, and yeah, he was signing autographs and and taking donations for his wolf sanctuary. Um, but yeah, he was there. I don't recall who was there the year before. I know there was a at least one person or somebody. I don't know who it was, but I know there was at least somebody there. There's somebody that I didn't really know who they were. But. Yeah. So I mean, we got to. I mean, I, everyone was able to meet and greet with with John while there, and that's I I thought it was pretty cool. Like, so this is my first thing. Um, I just looked up his age. He's 82. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I mean, we got, uh, we got to discuss just a little bit with him, you know, just, we didn't want to take a line that was there. We got a picture taken, um, which is pretty cool. Like I said, I, I'm posting to our stuff. I think might be used as a picture in the interview next week that I'm doing, uh, with, with Kyber cave. I don't know. I sent it over to them cause they want, you know, promotional stuff like that. But I mean, it was pretty cool. I mean, he had pictures there that he was signing. Um, he's just seemed like a generally nice guy. Yeah, I, I seemed like a good dude. I mean, yeah, it was what was the band name that he was talking was like Big Sweaty Big Men. Big Sweaty <laughs> Men. Yeah, Big Sweaty Men. <laughs> that was the name of the that band. Was a, was... That was an interesting story. Right. But yeah, I had... Apparently, as a local Chicago band, I had never heard of them, but apparently, he he knew of them. Big sweaty men. It's a hard thing to Google. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're probably not going to get the results that you want. No, no, not at all. Oh, and then you know, so after after the movie, like, so we got shouted out a couple times for being a sponsor, and then they had a Q and A, and I don't know if I was expecting a different type of Q and A versus. Oh well, yeah, I mean he. He got there and they were asking questions about the, you know, working conditions that they actually shot in Texas. And I, we, we have all heard the stories. It's just horrendous heat um, that they had there, you know. And he had kind of two little stories, well, a couple stories, right? He's talking about the chicken in the cage, right? That somebody had just like, was it his, was it his brother-in-law or like a PA? just found some roaming chicken in the area and they go, we're going to put it into a cage and that there's the chicken in the cage and that's the chicken room then. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, the problem was, is that they put the chicken in the tiny bird cage, but the chicken was content to be in the tiny bird cage. So his secondary job was to lay on the floor and poke the chicken with a broomstick to have it make chicken noises. Right. It wasn't making, chicken otherwise noises. the chicken wouldn't, yeah. Otherwise the chicken wouldn't make chicken noises. Which is a really interesting story. I don't, of all the stuff I've heard, I don't recall that story ever in the stuff I've listened. I don't know if it's out there. It'd be interesting if we were some of the lucky ones that will hear that story live. You know what I mean? Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't think. I, yeah, I don't think I've ever looked up like like live interviews. I mean, I know I've seen interviews with Toby Hooper before, but I don't not. <laughs> I don't think about this movie. It was uh, it was like later on because yeah. I mean, obviously seventy three. I wasn't even alive yet, so right. You know, and he said that it just turned the forty nine year anniversary of them shooting it. And the, it came out forty eight right. years ago. And they shot it forty nine years ago in August in Texas. Right. That sounds horrible. I yeah. cannot do the heat. I would not be able to do it. Let alone, especially him. Like. He was in Texas, and he was in a cast, essentially a prosthetic. I can't imagine how hot that was. Yeah, that's pretty. That's got to be boiling hot. Um, did you hear when he was talking about how long we got to have like one question from the audience? And it's a really awesome question. I think they asked, you know, what was the procedure done to get him into his costume? Right. And he says that you know they took you know the typical castings of his face, and that they made all the stuff. And it was like a piece by piece. Thing, which it didn't look like it was a that a piece by piece thing, which I guess is a good sign of it, right? It's all seemed like one giant piece to me, at right. least in the movie. And did you hear him say it took seven and a half hours to, to put it on? No, I didn't hear the actual time frame. That's a long time. That's a long time for anyone. Yeah, just for I mean, that's, <laughs> that's for sure. That's I, I couldn't I'm like as as much as I'd love to be in a horror movie. Because I would love to be the Sean Bean of horror movies. <laughs> right. I'd just be like, hey, hey, sign me up. I want to do it. Kill me in every single movie. I don't care. <laughs> I don't need- Yeah, well, I mean, it depends. I mean, they usually the, the effects guys have like different tiers of, of makeup. Yeah. 
They have like, depending on how close you are to the camera or how focused the camera is going to be on you. Yeah. So like, yeah, the guys like in the back had just have like, you know, a skull painted on their face. Right. Where like the guys in the front (laughs) have like all the latex zombie paint, you know, effects and shit. Yeah. I mean, so that was, that was pretty cool. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't realize that he was from India. That he went to, you know, theater school or teach, you know, acting school in Chicago, where one of the hosts of the venue went, was alumni of as well. Um, the Goodman Theater, yeah. Yeah, I looked up where he's from, and it's Brazil, Indiana, which is about three hours south of me. I just wonder. Well, maybe he can go to the drive-in. <laughs> maybe, yeah. This is yeah. It's a little bit just. It's probably like forty minutes west of where the drive-in is. Um. And then kind of the other story they talked about was, I, and I'm pretty sure I heard the story too, were the pot brownies. <laughs> I'm pretty right. sure I've heard that story. Somewhere. Well, yeah, I mean, it was 73. I'm not surprised. Or grass brownies. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and he, 73, it was grass. Yeah, and he, you know, he said he was able to get it because his brother-in-law helped write the movie and that his that means his what sister or did the catering and made pot brownies and talked about um, Gunner having like a whole tray of them. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> the world's best brownies and just you know, it's it's you hear stuff like that. I thought it was pretty cool. I mean, what what did you think of the stories that we were able to get from John? Oh, they're cool. I, I, I think I like the chicken story the best, but right. That's a that's a really fun, you know, funny story. Kind of the behind the scenes stuff. You, you know that it has to happen some some way. And usually, you know, if you watch like the Insert Darkness stuff like that, that people talk about like it's a family. That the movie is a family of people, right? That you whether your job is being an actor or not, you you know someone needs to lay on the ground and poke the chicken. Someone's going to do it, and it's just such a close knit while making these, especially these low budget movies is because you don't have the money for, you know, the hundred people to do it. It's just a small, close knit of pe- group of people. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's also probably the understanding like, Hey, if you don't like help out beyond your normal hired job, that's probably not going to get completed. <laughs> so right. if, if you want it to come out, you're going to need to help. Right. And that's uh, that's why I really like the Evil Dead story behind the scenes stories. I've heard, I think, all of them at this point in time. But yeah, Texas Chainsaw. I, like I said, I heard. I remember the pop brownies. You know, he talked about Gunner being just a gentle giant, except when you made him angry. <laughs> right. And it's cool, right? I I really liked it. I, I mean, I think best movie that we could have picked of the three, and that have you know help sponsor John Dugan be there too. It was pretty cool for me. Yes. All right. Um, so the next movie, The Howling. Um, quick synopsis. Uh, I missed what I missed. What the first fifteen twenty minutes of it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, uh, yeah. Uh, basically, the first the uh, movie opens um, with uh, it's what early eighties, I think. So yeah, it's like a, this lady is like a news anchor, like an investigative journalist. Um, and she is investigating um, a serial killer who the serial killer has like developed some kind of weird bond with her. It's where he keeps calling her and she keeps like, you know, talking to him over the phone and he's like giving her information. So the, the police have basically set up kind of like a sting operation because he said he wanted to meet her in person. Um, so like, you know, they set up this like sting operation. So where the police are supposed to be following her to go meet this serial killer and of course you know this is early 80s the technology is not great and uh you know she goes into this phone booth he calls her he tells her like some other location to go to to meet him um and they lose the signal so like the police are trying to scramble to find her there's no way to communicate with her that they haven't found her anyway um so they she goes to like this porno shop um and goes into one of the (laughs) the the uh the booths in the back (laughs) Um, and you know, she like sits down in the booth and then the guy is already apparently in the booth, um, behind her. And so he puts this, you know, the quarter and, you know, it starts playing this porn movie. Um, and then like, he keeps talking about how he wants her to see him or whatever. 
And then she turns to see him. You don't see his face at this point. And she screams and falls out of the room. And then, you know, <laughs> quick draw McGraw, the cop is shows up right at that time and just starts shooting in the room. Like he doesn't even see a person. He just starts shooting into the booth. And they do actually like the other cop actually calls him out. Be like, dude, what are you doing? Like you should just shoot when you don't know what's happening. But, um, you know, so he shoots and kills the guy who they, you know, Ed- discover is Eddie. Yeah. Yeah. Eddie Quist, who's, yeah. who's this, you know, serial killer guy. Right. But he's dead. Everything's fine. Um, she's suffering nightmares um, from that. She can't remember exactly what happened. She can't remember what she saw. Um, she can't remember what happened after she went in the booth. Um, so she ends up going to like the psychologist guy. Um, the psychologist guy's trying to help her, you know, obviously she's still got a lot of work to do. So he's like, okay, let, you know, I got this retreat up, up in the woods, you know, where you can, um, you know, it's like a retreat kind of thing. Right. So you go up in the, you go up in the woods, you know, with your husband, the, the husband, you know, gets hit on by this lady and he initially, you know, kind of pushes her off, but, um, he goes and, you know, she hears howling one night. Right. So he goes out to like, check it out. Right. Is that what he does? Yeah. Whatever. But anyway, he's out in the woods for some other reason. He gets attacked by a werewolf. Um, you see it for like a second. Um, and then, of course, like, you know, the next day he's eating meat when he was a vegetarian before, um, you know, and he's like, you know, getting a little bit more bestial. And then the next night, um, you know, she goes to bed and he runs out the door, you know, and he meets up with the, you know, the werewolf lady in the woods and they have, you know, weird werewolf sex in the woods. <laughs> Um, and then like, you know, they become like full on werewolves. Correct. Um, yeah. So then he comes back the next day and he's got like, you know, scratches all over his back and stuff. And she's like, Oh, where'd that come from? He's like, Oh, it's when I got attacked in the woods. She's like, no, it's not. (laughs) And then, and then he just like leaves and they just like drop the whole thing. And then, you know, or uh, no, then she hits her. He hits her Yeah, because she's going like, you're hysterical. And he hits her. And thankfully she like stands up for herself enough to like leave. And she calls her friends. Yeah, yeah. She calls her friend like, "Hey, you need to come help me because you know, or whatever." And so she comes up. There, her husband doesn't come up because he's busy with other right. they stuff. All, they both work at the TV where station. she's a news reporter at. Correct. Right. Yeah. She. Right. They're like in the. They're like in the production room. Yeah. Um. So yeah, she comes up without him. Um. You know, and they're like, you know, trying to you know, work their way through this thing. And, uh, you know, they're doing more investigative stuff. Um, the other lady, you know, is doing more investigation around the place. Um, she ends up finding, um, in the, in Eddie Quist, you know, the original serial killer in his apartment, they found a bunch of drawings that he had did. Uh, most of them were just of like wolf face looking people. Um, but there was one that was like a very detailed kind of like a landscape. Right. Yeah. So she's like, you know, of whatever doing her recording in the woods somehow, but she finds this same location. You know, she has the drawing with her. She holds it up like, Oh man, this is the same place. This is where he was when he drew it. Um, so she goes and she looks around and she finds this cabin. Um, and she finds out that, um, you know, the Eddie Quist, that serial killer guy had lived in this cabin. Cause there's a bunch of his like drawings up there. There's a bunch of like, you know, newspaper cutouts of like the killings that he had done. And, all this stuff. And there's like the, the smiley face sticker, which was kind of like his calling card that they showed earlier in the movie. Um, and so she's investigating that she starts trying to take pictures of it. Uh, and then she gets attacked by a werewolf, um, you know, who's like, you know, trying to get her. Eventually she ends up like cutting off its arm. Yeah. Um, and when they're fighting and then she gets away and she goes back and she's like, uh, she goes back to like the doctor's office and she's like, Oh man, there's werewolves. You know, she calls her husband like, Hey, you know, there's werewolves here. You got to like do something. You got to help us. Um, and then she gets attacked by a werewolf and gets killed like right afterwards. Right. Well, we um, find out she's going through the doctor's files that the beastie guy and the seductive witch are at or, yeah. siblings or related Right. Or yeah, yeah. We don't know if they're siblings or whatever, but they name. have the same last name. Right. Yeah. So they're all yeah, they're all like related. We find out that yeah, Eddie Quist, the that was actually a patient of the psychologist dude, so the doctor is kinda in on it somehow. Um so there's that. So yeah, she's dead. <laughs> um and then the 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 dude is coming up. So the lady um is now kind of on her own. Um 
trying to remember exactly uh, what happened. They, they basically like try to like recruit her correct into this into this like you know werewolf cult. Just kind join of join cult, us, right. yeah. It's so much better. Right. To be yeah, a they, werewolf. Blah 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 blah. Right. Yeah. So they bring her to the place where like all the werewolves have gathered together, and there's like it's like basically every other character in the movie in the in this colony place right. is a werewolf, and they're like trying to convince her to be a werewolf. Um. <clears throat> Was they said they can't kill yeah. her because she's too famous. So they said it'd be better to join. Yeah, either she joins or they have to like make it look like an accident or whatever. Right. Um, so yeah, as they're like, you know, trying to figure out what they're gonna do with her, the dude shows up um and he has silver bullets, which were kind of foreshadowed earlier in the movie when they were like book shopping about werewolves. At, at Ray's a natural occult bookstore essentially, but with a, <laughs> right. like a neighbor from Gremlins. <laughs> right. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Um. So yeah. So he has yeah a rifle with. Um. I mean, in real life, that rifle would hold like maybe five rounds, but it somehow holds like I don't know twenty five. Right. Yeah, it's movie. It's movie gun. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. So yeah, he goes there, and they're all like, "Oh, we're we're gonna attack you," and so. You know, they like as they. I mean, granted, they do call into the fact that it takes them like forever to change into werewolves. Like, their transformation takes like at least five full minutes. I mean, it takes a long time. And painful. There's a lot of like, yeah. yeah there's a lot of like bladder work happening in their face and, <laughs> and stuff. While it's, I mean, but it takes like a full five minutes, which is kind of funny because when the one investigative journalist is like watching him change, like she watches the entire five minutes instead of shooting, does yeah. it? Yeah, and doesn't do anything. Right. Doesn't run away. Just sits there the whole time. Anyway, um, so yeah, so they're like, "Oh, you can't stop us." You know, the one guy's like, "Go ahead and shoot me," and he fucking shoots him, and he dies. <laughs> and so they're like, "Oh shit!" <clears throat> um, so yeah, they're all like, you know, trying to stop him. They're slowly transforming, and he's just like picking them off, like one at a time. Only after they're transformed. Um, Right. Well, after they start transforming, because I mean, to be fair, he doesn't know which ones are werewolves. And, yeah. Until they start shifting, and when they get the fangs and the eyes, and he's like, okay, then he knows, and he shoots them. Um, and then they eventually like back him into the barn. They lock him in the barn. They you know douse him with gasoline, set it on fire, um, and they try to get away. And the werewolves get out, and they get into a car, and they're like chasing them down the road, and they're like shooting them through the roof and through the. You know, thing, and they eventually have to ditch their car. They get in the cop car because, of course, the local sheriff is a werewolf too. Correct. Yeah. Um. And so, yeah, eventually they get away. Um. But there's still werewolves left. They just, you know, stop the pursuit. So they, they get away. She ends up getting injured in the car on the way there. And the, you know, the the way that the mythos works is if you get injured by a werewolf, you will turn into a werewolf. It just takes like a day or so, or a couple days for it to happen. Yeah. Um, so essentially, to show the world that these werewolves exist, she goes back to the TV station and like does a special report where she like changes into a werewolf live on air, um, and then the dude shoots her and kills her with a silver bullet on air. Right, she's the fuzziest, cutest werewolf in the entire movie. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> she looks like like a fucking Ewok. Right, I mean, yeah, I guess the, the lady wolves look look different. So. Like so we'll discuss this more, and I'll probably have more to say after I rewatch it in its entirety again. It's been a long time since I watched these. Never, this is the first one I've ever seen in theaters. Grant, there haven't been many in theaters. <laughs> um, bladder work, phenomenal in the movie. Transformation at, at the bone country and the, the pushing out, it just seems like it's painful, because it would be. The always idea is they're painful. But the mythos is that they don't like to call them werewolves or lycanthropes, they're skinwalkers because they can change at will. It's not just during the full moon. Maybe the first transformation is in the full moon. That's usually how it, the mythos goes for some of, certain kinds of werewolves. That's on the first full moon you transform and they even mention that because they're, they're watching Lon Chaney Jr.'s The Wolfman <laughs> in the movie. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, the werewolf mythos changes a lot depending on where you go. I mean, yeah, some of them it's only you change on the full moon and you're not in control of yourself when you are. Um, some of them you can change whenever you want, right. you know, and it's, I mean, again, it's it's all over the place. Basically, the only, like, connecting thread between all of them is there's a person that can turn into a wolf-man hybrid. Right. <laughs> and that's it. But, yeah, we also have, like... Uh, what are they called? The loop de guru werewolves, which are, are werewolves that can only change 
if they like have like a skin of the wolf that's been specially prepared and they put it on like a like it's, a cape. Correct. Yeah, it's it's or there's the um in, in Dresden Files they have their hexen wolves. It's kind of like a hexen wolf. They have they have like a belt and the, they wear a belt with the wolf hide on it, and they're able to then transform with that as a hexen wolf. Right, but yeah, but they're not able to just do right. it at Mag- will. They magic need, is, they need magic is involved, right. or usually a hex right. is involved. It's not it's not a right. condition. It is a change that you have to have an article that's cursed or imbued with magical powers to become a werewolf. Right, right. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, I mean, well, I, I came from the world of I played. Um, a lot of vampire and werewolf, the white wolf games yeah. <laughs> back in, in my younger days in the nineties. And in those games, yeah, the werewolves can change whenever they want. Right. Like I so said, it's just, it just really depends. There's like different, like four or five different categories, just like there are for vampires. And yeah, well, I mean, yeah, vampires, you got like, you know, sometimes silver will affect them. Sometimes right. it won't. I mean, it's, you know, sometimes, you know, like the garlic and crosses will, sometimes they won't. It just depends. Right. What you know, mythos they're building, and for. what they don't necessarily talk about a lot is the, the, the regeneration powers that they have. Because they just go, "Oh, it doesn't matter. You chop off an arm, we will regrow it. There's nothing we can do to to kill us other than silver bullets." And at what point is it? Fifty one percent of the body needs to be left to be regenerated. What well, if it's fifty fifty? Does it go in the two? <laughs> what part comes back and whatnot? Right? Because they said they could just regenerate whatever they feel like it. Whenever they feel like it. Uh, well, I mean, they insinuated that, but that old man tried to kill himself with fire, so I think they know that fire will also kill them. I mean, that's generally the idea, is fire is a cleansing thing, and so silver is supposed to be pure. Well, I would, technically <laughs> acid is, too, and like somehow she threw acid on the dude's face, Yeah, and he wasn't healed, but it was also just like an hour later. So right. Like, his, well, his arm started growing back a little bit by the time we saw him again with his arm chopped off. Yeah, but it, yeah, but it wasn't it wasn't back. So it's not like an immediate thing. It takes like whatever, at least a day or two right. to happen. Right. Um so yeah, I mean the acid very well may have scarred him permanently at who knows. Yeah. So I mean like I said, it's been a very long time, probably since for you if you've watched this as a franchise, VHS days. But honestly, and these were a really hard franchise to get a hold of um, when I was going through franchises just because some of them are so rare and hard to find, like especially number two. You know, your werewolf is Holland two. Your werewolf is a sister. Your your sister's a werewolf. Your werewolf is yes. a sister. I mean, it's true too. <laughs> <laughs> your, your sister's um, a werewolf. Yeah, no this this movie, and I mean, I guess the franchise to a lesser extent has been on my list for a very, very long time, but I've never actually watched any of them. This is the first one that I've ever watched. So yeah, I think I watched through number six, which ended the nineties. And then we've had a couple since then. Yeah, no, this is the first one I've ever watched. Again, I've been aware it's been on my list for a long time, but just other things are always more important. Right. So, I mean, we, we talked about technical issues, talk about you know this, but let's, let's discuss werewolves in this movie. They're bestial, they're animalistic, but they're sexy, right? Well, at least the lady. Well, well, yeah, yeah. And it's just it, it's funny because it's I think the first time I recall seeing in, in a werewolf movie that they're almost like the the animal attractions there, right? You know that discount Tom Atkins was very attracted to. The lady, and I don't know if it's just the the bestial thing. It's almost like they had their, like the the sexuality of vampires, which you know they get compared to a lot. Whereas vampires, you know, yin and yang of the world and a lot of stuff. Well, yeah, vampires are more about seduction, right? Yeah, it's more about like seduction and then like sometimes manipulation. But depending on the story, sometimes it's just seduction. It's a, you know, but sometimes they might be hypnotizing you to get you to, you know, to be seduced. Who knows? Yeah. Um, but, you know, but uh, werewolves are more about just like, you know, bestial, instinctual Animalistic, energy. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, basically it's like they insinuate. I mean, because like his wife was even trying to like initiate with them when he was going through that change. And he's like, nah, no thanks. Right. Because I mean, because they, and he knows it's going to be, you know, just kind of like, you know, 
vanilla married sex, I'm assuming. <laughs> right. So he's just like, ah, I'm not really into that. Like I'm, I need to feel that beast. You know, I need to, I need to go find somebody that's, you know, going to ride this beast train with me. And so that's why he goes out and finds werewolf lady right after. Well, it usually seems in the um, first transformation that all their senses are overloaded. And that would make sense that they're more sexual at that time too. the, the first bestial urges come out. Well, yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you're going back to the reptile brain, that's that's what reptile brain ultimately wants to do is breed. Yeah. Right. So that's what. Yeah, that's going to be your base instinct. That's what you're going to follow. You're going to follow your your basic needs, which is like, you know, hunt, eat <laughs> and breed. I mean, that's Except I don't think you make a werewolf that way. Has it ever been what is has it? it ever been explored in a movie? Uh, I mean, it's been explored in a lot of <laughs> a lot of other media. In the White Wolf, they have a whole section in the Werewolf book about how that works out, and it's actually um, like Werewolf having a child with another Werewolf is actually a really bad thing. It's like inbreeding. Interesting. So there's like yeah, so they're like you know a lot of times they're born like sterile and they're like they're, they're deformed in some way and stuff like that. Uh, it's got something to do with the genes. So, like, they have what they call kinfolk, and the kinfolk are like people that carry the gene, but they don't like uh, they don't manifest. Okay. So, well, the main the main thing is 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 it kind of actually well, I guess it kind of goes into this movie is to where like when he showed his real face to her in that booth, and she couldn't remember. Um, in the White Wolf game, they have what they call the the veil. Which is when a werewolf changes forms, the human brain can't process that. It like it can't understand it. There's like a you know, it's also partly spiritual, but it's mostly just the brain just like, nope, this is not happening. <laughs> it's like so the vast majority of people just shut it out. It just like it never happened. So like even if you transform, you know, in when a place where people are around, it's a really, really high percentage that none of those people even remember it happened. Well, that's why people have a hard time remembering trauma or seeing something drastic right, in front right. of them. Yeah. Yeah. Right. They kind of go into that. Okay. And, I, and that's kind of what they, like I said, it kind of fades into it because she couldn't remember what she saw. And that's kind of what they go into. I mean, they probably used it from this movie is what I'm guessing is they, is they built on that. Um, but anyway, the, the kinfolk that carry the gene are immune to that. So they can see werewolves in their true form and they don't, they don't react to it because they have that gene. They just don't manifest. So they have like, you know, what they kind of call like, um, I don't know. It sounds bad calling them breeding circles. It sounds, it sounds <laughs> dirty in some way, but they have like, you know, people like a, a big extended kind of family that they can, um, you know, interbreed with to make sure that they can continue the line of werewolves. But again, you can't go manifested werewolf with manifested werewolf because like again the genes don't cross and they end up like in okay um and they're they have a certain name for them i think metis i think is what they call them but anyway but they yeah they're like outcasts because they're like you know inbred and deformed in some way blah blah yeah. we'll have to we'll have to go in some of these these sex and sex sorry and classes of different beasts like vampires and werewolves. I think we'd be a good talking point at some point just to just you know, discuss that. Um, but yeah, I mean, well, again, it gets like, it, depending on the world, that's why, you know, you can't yeah. just, yeah, you can't just say, okay, they're vampires. You have to say like, okay, well, what kind of vampires? There's a, there's a lot of different kinds, you know? Right. I mean, we got everything from like you know vampires that can walk in the sun; they just sparkle in the sun. <laughs> so, so being like you know the hardcore like old school Dracula type stuff, right? I mean, it it runs the gamut of everything. Yeah. So you can't just say vampires anymore. That really doesn't mean anything. Correct. All right. So, um, you, there was one short we saw, right? Over the shoulder, or was there another one? Did I miss one? Um. Yeah, there was the one about the Zad. It was like zombies against drunk driving. Oh, I, yeah, I didn't see that one. I saw that one. Over um, your shoulder was an interesting we... one. With the, with the yeah. guy at his computer, like was watching a camera girl. All of a sudden, changes like essentially a deadite watching him, and then, like the camera was kind of over his shoulder watching him, and it was interesting. Like it, like we discussed after we watched it on the drive back. 
that it was like a Crypt TV episode. I thought it was pretty good. I liked it. Yeah, no, it was pretty good. I don't. Yeah, I haven't watched any Crypt TV stuff, but I'll take your word for we'll it. We'll have to, like I said, discuss the the media of short horror movies, of kind of where they're where they're going. I like it. So I, I think it was interesting to be able to see a short like that. Um, I'm assuming it's from somebody there. Did they say where the shorts were, or it was just people sh- being able to show their shorts? I assume it was Chicago land area natives. Yeah, well, I mean, like that particular one, the over the shoulder one, they had a little Chicago sticker on his laptop. So, I mean, I know yeah. that they're either they're either from Chicago or trying to rep Chicago. Well, I mean, they didn't want to show the HP logo or well, Lenovo. Just, it was either HP or Lenovo on his laptop, his laptop model. Uh, no, it's pretty good. Yeah. I I would be interested in seeing more of that at other you know, conventions and movie marathons and stuff like that. Uh, that stuff is when done well, and I think that that was. The one I watched was really done really well. I'm, I'm interested in seeing more. Yeah. Now, like I said, last time I went, they had like a little like competition where they showed a bunch of short films and then everybody like voted on who okay. won and they won like a prize. And Interesting. Won. Yeah. All right. So why don't we discuss the vendors? I know you were able to see a little bit more of them than I was. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, we had we had John Dugan. At the table, when we walked in. Then we had mm-hmm. the you know the massacre, or, or was originally called like Terror in the Isles. Terror in the yeah. Isles, right? So their merchandise, they had some shirts, sci-fi spectacular. Um, there was a guy that had a whole bunch of, not a whole bunch, but a, a decent amount of like the NECA stuff for horror movies, which I see like just just replay by my house has tons of that stuff. I. If this was 20 years ago and I saw that stuff at Suncoast and his Evil Dead, I would have bought every single thing that was Evil Dead because that's what I did. Right. Um, and then, you know, we had the vendor who did a movie. I got his card. I, he wants me to contact him. It's like his wife is a screener in Chicago for movies, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, he was selling DVDs and VHS tapes. You know, as okay, so I didn't get anything. I know I'm tempted by that stuff, but most of the DVDs I already have VHS. I'm really trying to get to. If he had laser discs of horror movies, you and I would probably have been there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I definitely would have gotten them, but again, I mean, that's a very niche thing. Right. That's something you're going to bring to a little table <laughs> in a in a. In a yeah, he said he has at least 900 VHS tapes of horror movies. Yeah, not surprised. So, uh, what about the vendors on the other side? Did you get to go see them? Uh, I did. I just did a casual kind of walkthrough. I didn't really stop and and do much, but it was mostly like um, art and uh, kind of like flair, okay, <laughs> type stuff. Um, I mean, yeah, that's essentially what it was. Yeah, but I mean, it was it was uh, yeah, people like selling their art or at least you know art prints and stuff, and then. Yeah, just like flair, horror flair. Type okay. stuff. Did any of the other podcasters have anything there, like a table? Did you see? I just saw the swag. I didn't. At the table. I didn't see one. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't. I don't. I didn't see them at an actual table. They may have had one, and I just didn't see it. I mean, I really only did a casual run through like twice. Um, I didn't like stop and do like a you know inspection <laughs> of each table or anything. Right. Um, but I didn't see them have a dedicated table. I think they were just doing the the hosting thing and they're wandering around. Right. Which I I tried reaching out. Like I said when I was able to go out, they were gone. The other side the vendors were gone. So I hit them up online just to talk to them and you know kind of look into their part of Dread Central. I did a little bit of research into it today. You know it's. It seems like a paid advertising thing. I don't know. I'm going to reach out to the guy and just see what it is because there's a couple of cool things on there. And be, like I said, just good promotional stuff for us. But obviously, right. the cost, I don't know what the cost is. If it's absurd, not even going to think about it. But just to get us more out there. Well, yeah, I mean, we'll yeah. see. So this, is, this is the first thing, and you know, we're getting more and more into this. You know, We're going to get the website going. Um, I'm going to start trying to do more Facebook. I guess Twitter. <laughs> Don't want to do Instagram right now. I have no desire for that. Definitely not TikTok. We're too old. 
That's why you gotta get your kids to uh, do it, man. Yeah. Um, so let's let's discuss the venue. Um, have you been to the Davis Theater before for a marathon or a convention? Nope. No, this is the first time I was there. I, I think I know they've had it at the the Davis Theater before, but I didn't go to that one. The ones that I went to yeah, before, so, I don't remember the name of the theater it was at. But the theater that it was at before was it was an older theater. It was like a you know kind of like a repurposed old like you know like one of the Art Deco yeah. theaters. Um, and, and it was it was a little bit bigger of of a theater. Um, it wasn't as full. I, I can tell you that. But it was it was bigger. Um, but yeah, it was the the screens were were fine, but the sound was not great. Okay, and I think that was just because the theater hadn't really put in the money to like redo the sound. And I, I don't think it was like, yeah, you know, I don't think they had like a lot of blockbusters there or anything. So we're like the Davis Theater has like current run movies. I mean, they're obviously like modernized, and they have you know. It's it's a it's a business that still runs as a theater. That theater, I don't believe, was okay. At least as a movie theater. I mean, they probably had theater of other stuff, but I don't think they ran movies in there. Yeah, regularly. yeah. To me, it seemed like uh, the town I'm in, growing up, there was a local movie theater that had stuff like six months after it was in the bigger theaters. The AMC's were well, they weren't AMC's then, whatever they were in the area. Um, and it, it, it seemed a lot like that. I liked it. I thought it was an interesting uh, venue. You know, uh, I don't know. The person next to me was able to rock their chair. I was able to feel the rocking in my chair, too. I don't know if you were feeling that. Uh, no, no, not okay. really. I got lucky. The person next to me sat pretty still. So, Yeah, but I mean, overall, I mean, it, I mean, how many people do you think were in there? 100, 120? Yeah, around that. And I uh, said so they you know, posted it. It was sold out. And I mean, I think most people stayed kind of in their seats and stay there. We obviously we didn't get there right away, just for time frame wise. But yeah, I'm hoping that it was nice enough that you know they'd do it again there. I would really like to do that. Like I said, also do the drive-in one, and kind of just help support the, you know the massacre if they call it the, if they're going to keep it that or I'll you know tear in the aisles and, and do this again for sure. Um, but. You know, we briefly just dis- we briefly talked to a, a couple of the the crew that were running this. I don't re- I don't recall their names off the top of my head. Um, I don't know enough. I don't want to slaughter. <laughs> I, mean, I remember parts of it, but I don't want to be. I don't want to be that guy. Yeah. So I mean, but they're they're good people. How about oh that? yeah, they're, they're, they're like I said, I was I was using Facebook Messenger. That's why I reached out to them. Just like I said, for for shits and giggles, was that a couple of weeks ago? We we're discussing it, um, and we were able to do it. And they seem really nice guys. Uh, messaged them. They asked the, today. They asked you know how how things were, how we like it. I talked about you know this is this is our first time doing this. You know it's my it was my first marathon or convention with vendors ever going to it. And I, I told them like it was great. I liked it a lot. I don't know what I was expecting. Quite honestly. Like for some reason in my head, I, I had between like not quite a con, you know, Comic Con, but this mm-hmm. is probably what Comic Con was like twenty years ago. <laughs> well, yeah, when I was a kid, that's what comic conventions were. Like they would rent out like a Knights of Columbus hall, right. you know what I mean? And it was just a bunch of dudes at, at booths with boxes of comics. That's all it was. Right now, it's just a big extravagant thing. Well, yeah, now, yeah, there's people doing cosplay and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it, it's great. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying, like, when I was a kid going to the conventions, they were not as interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, like I said, the the the, you know, the the crew members or workers that were part of this, I think there was, like, eight or, or ten people, I believe they said, you know, involved with everything, setting this up and doing all the stuff. I think they did great work. You know, um, I think they did really good shout-outs for us, for everyone that was involved with it. Um, you know, the, the mic up front was a little hard to hear sometimes, especially with, with John Dugan. Um, but, you know, I I went up there, um, handed out some of our, our shirts that I had made. And overall, I just, you know, they, they, you know, they go, hey, what can we do for you? You know, it was cool. I liked it. And they even offer us free tickets to 
uh, the drive-in if we were able to make it. But <laughs> um, so neighborhood-wise, I know you are kind of familiar with neighborhoods. This was in. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I could have sworn I've been down there before. Uh, one one of my old old jobs when I was in Chicago. The one of the owners lived down Milwaukee Drive. But I mean, the only the only complaint I really had with the neighborhood was parking because of Apple Fest. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, if Apple Fest was not there, I think we would have been a lot better off. But um, yeah, we ended up you know because we ended up going in like a train going around <laughs> the Apple Fest, like trying to find parking. Um, but, but I mean. You know, yeah, we had to do a little walk to get there, but it wasn't, it's not bad. It wasn't bad. Uh, I mean, you have to be used to that. Going in the city, you have to be used to doing a little bit of that. That's probably the shortest walk I've ever had to a venue when I've gone to Chicago, quite honestly. I mean, I've walked from, oh. I've walked from Millennium Station to the theater by, uh, Goose Island by the Cups Field. It was a long walk. It took about two hours to do. It paid for a cab. We hoofed it. For two hours, yeah. the way back, like we're not. This is 2008. When I was seeing my name is Bruce, then because Bruce Campbell's there, I dragged the then girlfriend, now wife, up there. And it's like, you know, we're doing it. And like, oh, we're not gonna catch, catch the last train out of Chicago. We took the train in and it was like midnight. Like, I guess I'll have to pay for a cab. But other than that, that was, it's an ex- that's an expensive cab. It's a very expensive cab. <laughs> but I wasn't going to make another two hours back for the. One one a.m. train, or right. train in Chicago. Hotel have been more expensive than the the, the cab, but I mean that's true, Uber yeah. wasn't around then, so not much of a choice. <laughs> right. Oh, overall, though, I mean, I think it was it was great. You know, I, I can't remember the last time I've been downtown Chicago for a event like is before COVID. Well, yeah. Uh, but you know the crowd. Oh, we're all used. We discussed this briefly. Um, you know, essentially the same crowd of, of essentially goers, right? You know, people that enjoy horror movies. I don't know. In my head, I was expecting some cosplay. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just no. like a mask or something, right? Or, or something. I, I don't know. Like I said, this is my first one. The, I guess my experience has been just what's on TV and. And movies is, is for marathons um, and conventions. Yeah. Well, you don't you don't get cosplay unless you get like a big place. Like if you're in like you know um, the McCormick Center, <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. Like I mean, yeah. Or McCormick Place. Yes. Then you're gonna get people uh, dressed up in cosplay because it's gonna be a big old convention. Right. But if you're just at your local, you know, like your local, you know, neighborhood type one, no. <laughs> they don't. They don't do that stuff. I've been to. I've been to quite a few of them, and yeah, I've. I've never seen. I mean, I've seen like um, some goth folks and like their their heavy goth makeup, but I mean that that's not something that they you know don't do when they go out normally. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I mean that's about it. I've never seen anybody get like you know crazy. <laughs> you know, messed up with with stuff like that. Um, I mean, I've seen a couple. Don't get me wrong, I've seen a couple, but very uncommon. I just, like, maybe it's because, I think we discussed this before, was when I was growing up, a couple towns over, there was a theater that showed uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show every Friday at midnight and people dressed up for it. And I think oh, yeah. that's what kind of I had in my head. <laughs> okay. Was that? Exp- I, I, I been to part of that? But I think that's more of a cultural thing with the movie. Like, so they they bring toast, they throw it at the screen, and they say, here's a toast. All that sort of thing. Um, right. But, I mean, I think everyone was kind of wearing a horror shirt of some sort. Well, yeah, you gotta wrap right. it, man. That's how I mean, it we were wearing our stuff, obviously. Uh, Correct. Well, overall, I mean, I think for, I mean, for the area, it wasn't that big, but I all felt, felt like we were just, just sardines in a can. I've been places where it's that, right? I'm sure you have too. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> you know, just shoulder to shoulder crowds. Uh, but overall, no, I think the venue was great, and I- I'm hoping they can do it there and, you know, um, then go from there. I hope they, I hope it grows more, honestly. I'd like to see more. Well, they already, they already sold it out. I don't think they can get any bigger than that unless they rent out all the theaters. Right. 
But then they'd have multiple movies playing, and you'd have to make a choice on which one you want to watch. Yeah. I'm just wondering if there's a bigger... I mean, Chicago's big. I don't know if they'd be able to do... A, well, yeah, you can get a giant theater, but giant theater means giant pay. Show, right. You know what I'm saying? Like, you got to pay... I wonder if you could just do a hall, a bigger hall. I don't know. It, it's... Well, if you want, if you want to get them a bunch of money, I'm sure they'll yeah, be, they'd love to do not, it, but they're going to have to pay for it, right? Um, so, you know, like I said, this is our first convention slash marathon that we've been doing with the podcast and first sponsorship. You know, something you want to do again next year? Yeah, I'm on okay. Um, I'm wondering if we can get involved, or if they, there's only certain movies. I'm, I'm sure they have to. I don't know, like they have to pay for the rights to show it in the theater, I would assume. Uh, I would, I mean, I would guess so. I mean, but I, yeah, I have, I have no idea. I'm just, yeah, I, like I said, I want to do it again. They already asked, you know, I told them like, Hey, you guys do this again, hit, hit us up. And they said, absolutely. So that's cool. Yeah. Um, so I was, like I said, this would be our first one meeting new people. You and I have some issues sometimes meeting new people, let alone talking. You know, <laughs> yeah, I'm not I'm not good at human interaction at all. I'm much better at in like a, a virtual space, right? Uh, like I said it was they had asked us if we wanted to go up there and announce the movie and give a description. Um, maybe if we had more time, if maybe we had more prep, because the, the podcast Friday the Thirteenth they. They talked about the movie for what a couple of minutes before it. And a, you know, I think they just, I think they just signed on to sponsor it like a couple of weeks before. That's what made me realize, I'm like, hey, you know, they're able to get into it. I'm like, that that's cool. Let's see what we can do. Um, you know, handing out the shirts, I didn't obviously say anything, which was fine with me because I was quite nervous anyway. As it was, we didn't have enough shirts clearly for anyone that wanted the freeze t shirt. <laughs> right. Um. But maybe, like I said, if if we can get in more, like not say involved, but pick the movie, I think it'd be cool. Like if we consensus, like kind of our favorites, we can do something like that. Um. Maybe, like I said, have buttons or cozies. What were, what were they even calling them that, that last night? They weren't. I don't think they're calling them cozies, were they? Cozies. They're called they're cozies? cozies. I thought they were cozies. Uh, maybe in Indiana. Yeah, it must, must be in Indiana. Thing. <laughs> Here in, in Illinois and uh, everywhere else, they call them koozies. Okay. Beer koozies. Okay. Huh. K K O O Z I E. Koozie. I don't know if I've ever seen it spelled out. If you go on the internet, type <laughs> it in, I guarantee you'll get some results. So, I mean, other than a couple shirts, um, maybe, you know, professionally done instead of me doing it myself. Like I said, I have a guy. Oh, if you do them and sell them for money, you're technically a professional. Yeah. Uh, Man. Boom, done. Uh, no, but I have I, I have a guy in my town that did all of my brewery shirts uh, that I did the logo for years and years and years ago. Uh, they're not expensive, but if we're able to sell them, sure, why not? You know, but, you know, get some koozies and maybe some pins or swag, I think would be Cool to have next year, or next time. I don't know when the next one's going to be. I said, I know they're talking about they're going to, uh, uh, uh was it Dead Con? Dead Con? Yeah, Walking Dead convention. Oh, yeah. I've actually been to that. Have before. you? <laughs> yeah. But I'm not sure there's anything for us to do there other than us go. Um, I mean, it's, it's essentially a picture the same thing only without the movies. Okay. So instead of movies, they have like um, like presentations and kind of like uh, you know where you, like you sit down and they have like you know people on stage. They'll either be like discussing a topic and they'll have like you know panel discussion on topics, or sometimes they'll have like a star from the show. But they don't really have enough to like do just that. So like they have like a whole section of like an autograph section. And it'll be like um, all kinds of people from like the genre. Like I said, it's uh, the geek worlds have like combined in a lot of ways. Um, so like you know the horror world and like your uh, 
you know, fantasy world and your sci-fi world, like all these things have like kind of converged so that they can all kind of feed on each other and like help each other get bigger so they can do bigger events so that they all do each other. Like, um, the, the walking dead kind of, it was mostly like most of the vendors were all like, you know, zombie themed horror themed stuff. Yeah. Um, but not all of them, but when we went over to like the autograph stuff, like this was at the time game of Thrones was like, you know, stratosphere big at the time. Um, and they had, uh, Brienne was there. Really? Yeah, she was there doing autographs. Oh, they wow. had Stephen Amell doing their autographs because it was the arrow was still really big at right. that time. Um, so they had, uh, yeah, <laughs> no, one of the I don't know one of the Amells. I forgot which one it was, but one of them was there. Um, they had um, Jay Bonasinga, who is the guy who wrote the Walking Dead novels. He was there. Um, oh, they had some of the actors from the show, but they weren't. I can't remember at the life of me who they were. Interesting. But they were, I mean, but they were some, I mean, they were like some of them. I don't, I like, I know like Rick wasn't there. And <laughs> like, there wasn't like, but, it, but there was, you know, people that were in the show. I mean, they were like, they were there. Um, God, I can't remember. Um, uh, they had one guy that was in the wire. One of the main guys from the wire was there. And was he the, I don't know. Was he the one like that went to community? Like the last season of Community? Uh, I don't remember. Okay. I don't remember. But anyway, there was a whole bunch of people there. Um, and so, yeah, but I did, I've actually been to that before. But it's, uh, yeah, and it's essentially the same thing. It's just a, it's just a convention. But again, they, like I said, all these worlds kind of combine to make sure that they can all be successful right. together. So like one will be leaning more towards one theme, but not, it won't be all of that. It'll be other. Yeah. Things. They said, yeah, they're doing the dead con and they're doing something else. I know in our area, stranger things cons coming up as well. Okay. Uh, but I, don't, uh, I can say that. I don't want to. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, I don't get me wrong. I like stranger things. It's just, uh, it's a very, very popular right now and it's going to be very busy and it's going to be a lot of younger folks. And, uh, <laughs> right. Nothing against the younger folks, but they're, you know, I'm old <laughs> and they're, they're faster and <laughs> louder than I am. And I don't really, I'm want not, to I'm not that far behind stuff. you there, buddy. <laughs> yeah, so I don't want to, I don't want to be fighting them for stuff. So yeah, you guys can have it. You guys are doing a good job keeping it going. I'm not going to get in your way. So, yeah. So it sounds like, did you ever watch the show con man with Alan Tudyk? Con Alan man. Tudyk. Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm a, I'm aware. Yeah, of it. I had so, a, I mean, they had panels that he'd just go up there and have discussions, like Q and A panels. It wasn't showing movies or anything like that. So it was kind of like that, like a true con. Yeah, yeah, okay. right, right. Yeah, I like I like the I like the mix of the the movie marathon and convention. I think, especially if we can get in there and sponsor something like that, that'd be more upper alley. I mean, maybe we'd go and just be ourselves at other things at some point. Not not mm-hmm. sponsor, obviously, but still just go to it. Just horror stuff. And just kind of subscribe and see what's there, you know, in our area. I don't want to go too far away. Right. I said maybe the, the drive in would be the farthest. Uh, yeah, no, I think that kind of the year I went, I mean, this is years back. This is not, <laughs> not recent. I would say probably yeah, maybe like 10 ish years okay. ago. Maybe, maybe like nine, maybe eight, whatever. But it was a, kind of around there. Um, it was like, yeah, but Walking Dead was at its like peak popularity, and like Game of Thrones is at like peak popularity. It was before it declined and everything. Um, but yeah, and I went there uh, to do that, and it was, yeah, it was. I mean, it was, it was cool. Sounds but, more exciting than the thought cons I went to in Chicago, where I fell asleep because they were boring. It was about technology. Yep. <laughs> yep. And there was there was a little bit of cosplay there, not a lot, yeah. but there was some. So I mean. Our plan is to do this again, right? And we do it next year. We'll be close to shortly after our one year of, of doing this podcast. We'll have a lot more stuff under us. I think be better prepared. Is there anything that you'd want to see from the next time we do this? Um, you know, that you would hope to do or, or get out of it? Um, no, I mean, I hope that there's movies that either, I would really want to see in the theater or movies that I have not seen before <laughs> that I actually want to see. I mean, that would be cool, but again, it's whatever, man. I mean, whatever works, whatever's going to bring the crowds in. That's I'm cool. Yeah. With that. If you had to pick a movie, 
your ideal movie to if we were able to pick a movie to sponsor, what would it be? Video uh, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we can't give away anything right now about Video Drum. Uh, it's going to be on our list, and people have to tune in to, to catch stuff from it when we discuss the Video Drum, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, we could have the opportunity if we were doing the driving one. <laughs> All right. At 3 a.m. Oh, we have been dead. We have been yep. dead tired. Uh, I mean, you can probably guess what mine is. Uh, interview with yes, the vampire. Clearly, clearly that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. No, well, I mean, the big question is is it going to be one or two? I mean, that's the big question. <sighs> See? You don't even know. <laughs> uh, uh, one. <laughs> Okay, I mean that's I would I would bet on that, but I'm saying it's up in the air whether it's one or two. Well, definitely, definitely one. I mean, last year would have been the ideal year to do it because I saw Evil Dead back in theaters because it was the 40 year anniversary of it. And while there's other drive-ins up in Michigan that Bruce Campbell was at, he was not at this one. I wish he was, but he still had a little video thing. And I said I met him once. I'd love to be able to do it again. He's much older than us, <laughs> but I mean, I mean, yes. yeah, Evil Dead sponsorship, I would absolutely love. I mean, clearly, half my sleeve is Evil Dead. So, <laughs> oh, I mean, that's yeah. I don't, I don't know the the red tape and and <laughs> all that stuff involved in, in picking a movie or getting a movie there. But I mean, more power to you. But. Yeah, yeah. Like I said maybe we'll maybe we can see how that process goes and. Obviously, they want stuff that people show. I just wonder how they pick Child's Play too, as opposed to the first one. Something had to happen. Oh, like I said, it's probably easier to get, is my guess. Right, and it makes sense they had Texas Chainsaw because they had John Dugan there. So, do you think they got John Dugan well, first, and then they go, "Hey, we're gonna have to show Texas Chainsaw"? Uh, I mean, I don't know. It was called the Massacre way before they announced that Texas Chainsaw Massacre was going to be there. Um, a lot of the art on the posters and stuff was Leatherface, so I don't know if they knew ahead of time or not. But also, one of them has Frankenstein, yes. so and they didn't have any Frankenstein movies, so I don't know. Maybe they just were just going with that theme, and they got lucky enough to get, to get it. I don't know. Again, I don't know what happens behind the scenes to get these movies picked. Right. So. I, I can't, <laughs> I can't make an accurate guess as to how or why. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be interested in just in the, the fundamentals of it and what goes into it. I like to see behind the curtain and see how things work. I know. <laughs> Send them a message and say, "Give me your secrets." <laughs> Give me your secrets. They're, they're probably, they're probably going to think you're going to want to do your own thing, and they're probably going to be like, "I'm not telling you nothing." No. Which is fair. Right. Which is fair. No, I like. I said that. I'd love to see it grow. Honestly, I enjoyed it that much. I'd love to see it grow. Yeah, oh, it was cool. It was fun all day. <laughs> like I said, I've, I've been to, I've been to a couple of the sci-fi spectaculars before, um, and I liked them a lot. I, again, I liked it enough the first time to go back a second time. Um, I didn't go after that just because I had stuff going on, and then the pandemic happened. So. Did we miss this year's? Uh, I don't. Th- they didn't have one this year. This is the first one since the okay. pandemic. I wouldn't mind. But I know I know they had one at the Davis Theater before the pandemic. Okay. That was the one that I didn't I didn't go to. I was I was I almost went. I didn't buy tickets or anything, but I was I was kind of trying to plan to get there and then I ended up getting scheduled to work that weekend. So okay. I mean it'd be interesting. I wouldn't mind going to the sci fi one too. I know it's it's more of your jam, but I also really enjoy sci fi. Yeah. <laughs> Again, it's the same thing. I mean it's most of the same people. It's just gonna be instead of wearing horror shirts, <laughs> they're wearing Sci-fi shirts. I mean, it's more or less right. the same. Uh, again, like I like I said before, a lot of these worlds and realms have combined together. Yeah, and it, I mean, it's good because again, they're they're making the whole thing big enough to like you know everybody can support each other and, and keep it moving forward. Um, there's a lot of crossover between some stuff anyway. Sometimes the line blurs, you know, especially like sci-fi horror that happens a lot. Right. Um. So yeah, I mean it. 
yeah, it's uh, it all happens sometimes. <laughs> but yeah, if it's sci fi leaning or horror leaning, it's just going to be different pictures on the t shirts. It's more or less all the, the only difference it is. And the vendors will be selling themed things back and forth, but they'll be more or less the same, just themed to different. Yeah. If they ever get, if we ever look at that and they start doing some horror sci fi, we'll have to see if we can get on that too, especially like Event Horizon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure they will be. I mean, you know, like, but again, there's a lot of elements that go back and forth. That, I mean, that's, you know, to get, you know, to like a college level class to discuss the difference between things sometimes. I mean, we've obviously touched base a bit so far on this podcast. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm just saying, if you look at what defines each genre, a lot of times that crosses over, you know, sometimes heavily into one, heavily into the other, but. Sometimes just touches on it, but it can still technically be considered, you know? right? So yeah, but we'll we'll keep our eyes out and hopefully see if we can't at least go to them, if nothing else. Right. So. All right. Anything else that you want to add about the event from last night? Uh, no. Okay. Well, then stay tuned for next week's podcast. Um, we're going to be splitting up the Hellraiser franchise. We're going to do two different uh, podcasts of it because it is encompassing what this Friday on the 7th, the 11th movie in the franchise. And for us to be able to go and dive deep, not deep, deep, but deep into the movie, we're splitting it up and we'll be discussing the first five movies of the Hellraiser, Hellraiser franchise. So this is Graveyard saying heavy check on the children. And this is Salem saying long live the new flesh. Bye.